thanks very much for the introduction, Paul. I'd like to say, <clears throat> pardon me, right at the outset that my expertise is not in construction. I'm a roboticist. I've been doing robots for nearly 30 years. I started in manufacturing a uh, long, nearly a decade working in the mining industry, looking at automation there, underground and open pit, uh, more recently in, uh, in the agriculture sector. So I think what I can most usefully do today is to inform you, <clears throat> pardon me, experts in construction, what's happening in robotics. What's what robotics is and what robotics isn't, I think a really important concept that I'd like you to walk away with. To know also what's coming and to know what's possible. So my job today is just to inform. Now, there's so much that I could talk about and I've only got 15 minutes to do it. So I'm gonna go very quickly, I'm gonna skate very lightly over a large number of topics. So to get started, a probably good question is, what is a robot? And there are some very dry technical de descriptions of what a robot is, and I don't think they're particularly helpful. So what I'm going to do is give you some examples. The word robot actually is a Czech word. It comes, was first coined in a play in 1920. It's nearly 100 years old. Uh, and it's from a Czech word that means effectively forced labor, slave. <clears throat> That, that kind of concept, that's where it comes from. And this first robot play is about humans creating machines to remove the drudgery of everyday work. Uh, and this is a recurring theme in, in fiction. Another recurring theme in fiction is robots as super intelligent machines. Now, this is fiction. We can't build machines that are as intelligent as the ones portrayed here or the ones portrayed in many, many other movies. And in fact, the reality is that these guys are many metal suits, right? We can't produce machines that are that clever. They look intelligent because they've got human beings inside them. So another important takeaway, robots are not as intelligent as what you see in the theatres and on television. Another definition of robots is this tireless factory workers. And this is you know, a very common application of robots. There's a million robots like this working in factories around the planet. These machines are very fast very accurate and can lift very, very heavy loads. And this is a state-of-the-art robot assembly line. This is the Tesla plant uh, recently built in California. So it's manufacturing electric vehicles. It's sort of poetry in motion. It's a gorgeous thing to watch. <laughs> that technology is also quite old. The manufacturing robot, uh, first one went, in, went to work in 1961, unloading die-casting machines at a GM plant. Uh, and created by, it's basically a startup created by two uh, very, very far thinking guys uh, way back in the very early 1960s. So, this is manufacturing robots. It's got a very, very long history, and today it's a very, very mature technology. I like to think of robots actually very simply as machines that just move things from A to B. Right? In this particular case, this arm robot is moving packages off a conveyor belt and putting them in a carton. A bigger robot maybe picks the cartons up and puts them on a pallet. An even bigger robot may be picking the pallets up and putting them onto a truck. So a very common application for robots is just moving things from one place to another. Here's an example of another robot doing exactly the same thing, but this is an automated pallet, pallet truck. So it's going to pick up a pallet at location A and it's going to put it on top of another pallet at location B. This is what robots do. They move things from A to B. And we can do this on a very large scale. So it can be done at a container port. In fact, the port of Brisbane is, has at least one, one port there is fully automated. So the containers are taken off the ship using a key crane, put down on the key side, and an automated straddle carrier comes in, picks it up, and pops it onto a container stack. Sometime later, another strad come, comes by, picks the container off the container stack and puts it on a truck, and off it goes. This is reality. We can do this today. This is a marvelous example. This is uh, an Amazon fulfillment center. And there's a bunch of little orange robots that scuttle along the, along the ground, get in underneath the shelf and pick it up and bring it to the person who is fulfilling somebody's order. So instead of the person filling your Amazon shipment, wandering around the warehouse, picking things out of this shelf and that shelf, they stand still and the shelves come to them. It means that they can be far more productive. It means that they can jam a whole lot more shelves into the warehouse because you don't need room for human beings to walk between the shelves. It's the shelves are in continuous motion. It's a wonderful thing to behold. So Amazon is a robot enabled company. Without robots, they wouldn't have a business. Labor cost. One of the traditional reasons for using robots is to reduce labor cost, improve productivity, and basically maintain the economic health of an industry. 
Uh, I've been talking to a few people around construction, numbers around the 50% mark, perhaps of labour cost in producing a building. And uh, maybe over a beer we could have a discussion of what this, what this number really is. Uh, if there's any violent agreement, you could let me know. If you look at other industries, you look at the iPhone. Uh, I guess building construction people would love to have numbers like this. 50% is pure profit. Uh, manufacturing cost is 2%, uh, and the rest is materials, right? So that's one sort of manufactured item, an, an iPhone. Uh, very different sort of cost breakdown compared to a manufactured item like a building. You look at white goods. Uh, white goods made in Western Europe, maybe a third of their manufacturing cost is labour. In Eastern Europe, maybe it's a quarter of their manufacturing cost. Still way less than the uh, hypothesised labour cost fraction for building and construction. So these are all the manufacture of white goods, manufacture of iPhones is highly automated. So perhaps by bringing more automation, more robotics into the manufacture of buildings, maybe this is an aspirational target. Okay, I said before that robots move stuff from A to B. And looking at any construction site, there seems to be a lot of stuff moving from A to B. It's moved by cranes, it's moved by forklifts, it's moved by pallet trucks. So what can we do? So this is an example from MIT, and the guy is shouting at the forklift truck with a megaphone, saying, come to receiving. Forklift truck picks that up, and in it comes. Uh, and it's going to come to receiving. And you can see it's a kind of Frankenstein forklift truck. It's bristling with all kinds of sensors, and it's got a big box on the top. It's a computer. Up the top left corner, you can see the robot's view uh, of the scene. It's looking at the truck where it has to put the pallet. It's finding a spare spot on the truck, and it's going to take that pallet, and it's going to drop it onto the truck. So see the massive computing rig and sensory rig up on the top there. You might say this is crazy, this is impractical, you know, it'll never work. If you consider the car that won the DARPA Urban Challenge in 2007, came from Carnegie Mellon University, a robot called BOSS, looks a bit similar, right? It's bristling with all these kinds of sensing devices and most of the car was full of computers. That was 2007. By 2012, a Google car looked like this. The computers were all in the boot. It could hold a bunch of passengers. By this year, the Google car looks like this. It looks like a naughty car. It doesn't have a steering wheel or pedals anymore. It is completely autonomous. It's a little transport pod. You hop in and takes you where you want to go. So look at the MIT forklift and say it's a crazy looking thing, but with the way technology evolves, it won't be long before it can be a Schmick product that looks something like this. The technology evolves very quickly. Another issue is around safety. Automation is not just about productivity. That was certainly one of the drivers when we were doing the mining automation work. Uh, you have accidents which are going to cause injuries, potentially fatalities, as well as damage to forklifts and things around the forklifts. So again, with automation, with drivers that pay attention 100% of the time, you could eliminate a lot of industrial accidents. And that's, all, that's got to be an important secondary benefit. We could also take robot technology, their standard assembly robots, and we could use them to do things like laying bricks. Uh, so maybe you can get much more intricate patterns in your brickwork if you've got a robot there doing that kind of work. And this is a little clip that I lifted off the web. This is a, an artist impression of, uh, of a bricklaying robot. So it's picked up a brick, it's uh, putting some mortar on the sides, and it's going to place it down next to the brick that it laid previously. Uh, this company apparently has this now as a product, and they push it as a semi-automated system. So it works in conjunction with a skilled bricklayer, who maybe is going to go and tap and adjust the, the bricks a little bit, but the bulk of the work of lifting up the brick and putting on the mortar is done completely autonomously. So they've got the ability for, uh, for the, the humans who are working with this robot system to load bricks into, into hoppers, so you can imagine hoppers of bricks being lifted from trucks up to where the robot's working, and this robot's on a rail system so that it can move around the building and do its work. Another thing that uh, we certainly learned from the application of robots is that they perform very, very well in factory environments. They spent really the first 60 years of the robot's existence has been in factories, and only more recently that robots are getting out into the real world. So I think there's a lot of application for robots in prefabrication of buildings. Again, there's another nice little clip that I lifted off the web and showing a prefabricated wooden building. So designed with a lot of very complex interlocking panels. The panels are milled by robots, each one individual, individual shape, size, and then they are lifted into, lifted into place 
and is to construct a building. So there's a way we can move a lot of the labor, a lot of the effort from a, a field environment, a building site, where it's all a little chaotic and, uh, and perhaps not very conducive to doing actual work, we can put that into a factory and just do the very last stage on, on site. And there's the finished product. A lot of you have probably heard about this kind of technology referred to as drones, uh, flying machines with cameras. And this gives you a wonderful perspective on the world. And perhaps if you've already built a structure and you want to understand its condition, perhaps you could use a technology like this. This is a rather controversial video. A uh, German tourist came to the Gold Coast and he brought his own uh, drone with him and he flew it, totally illegally, uh, up and over the Seoul building. Uh, but you get an idea of the wonderful vantage you can get to be able to inspect a window on maybe the 40th floor without having to lower somebody down on a rope is, is absolutely fantastic. And if he'd perhaps been a more ambitious, he could have flown much, much closer to the building. And now you've got this marvellous view as he flies over, over the top. Uh, I think he got his knuckles quite severely wrapped for, for doing this. Uh, but. If you work with the airspace regulator with CASA, you know, this is a wonderful technology that gives you, you know, fantastic views that you would not otherwise get. Here's another similar technology. We have one of these devices, the QT. It's a little, uh, little fixed-wing aircraft. You can assemble it very, very quickly. You just throw it into the air. Uh, you control it from a ground station, tell it where you want to go. It uh, records pictures. So here's a series of pictures that it's recording at quite high resolution. And this is a flying robot that I can carry to a site in a briefcase, right? And anybody can, anybody can fly this thing. Here's a different environment. It's flying, flying over a quarry. Uh, it's stitched the pictures together and done a full three-dimensional reconstruction just from flying this little robot over the quarry. So that's what it looks like in 3D. Uh, we can compute profile lines. Uh, we can compute contour maps and so on. So this is the sort of information gathering that uh, flying robot technology can give to you. And there's certainly some interest in using this uh, for, for, building, uh, for building applications. This is a robot, we have a QT, and it's spent quite a lot of time wandering around the bookshop. And this robot does mapping. So as it's wandering around the bookshop, it builds up a full metric map of the bookshop. We can see the walls, we can see all the shelves that are in there. And just by the robot wandering around, it can build up a map. So imagine you wander around a building site. You know, every day it goes around and builds up the map. You can see what's different between today and tomorrow, what's different between design and build. Uh, this is a very standard robotic technology. Uh, and people are already starting to think about this in the building, uh, in the building scenario. And Elliot Duff will talk later and mu in much more detail about mapping. Another thing going around a building site, there's stuff everywhere. How do you know where the stuff is? So if you've got a robot going around building maps, and maybe you could say, well, okay, all the, all the vent ducts, they're over here, and all the plaster sheets, they're over there. So we could be doing continually tracking the inventory, what's where. Crane automation. Uh, a lot of cranes in building sites, and the Premier talked earlier about his delight at seeing all the cranes on the, on the skyline. A long time ago, we did some work with automating drag lines. The drag line is probably the first cousin of the uh, building crane. Uh, slightly different architecture, but basically hoists big loads up and moves stuff around. In this case, 100 tons of overburden at a time. And this project that we did in the early 2000s was at automating the crane. And we were able to capture the skill of the human operator into a computer system, and it was able to perform certainly as well as a dragline operator with perhaps one year of training. So what you see now is the traditional way that the operator drives the drives the drag line with a, a couple of levers and some, uh, some, your, some slew pedals. And uh, in a moment, you'll see the machine driving itself. The advantage of this technology is that it improves the utilization of the machine. It lowers the stress on the machine because the computer, you see now the computer is driving the machine, hands off. Uh, so it's going to drive it much more nicely, much less stress on the machine, and allows you to use lower skill operators because a lot of the high skill is now encapsulated in the computer system. Here we see flying robots assembling a structure. So instead of using cranes to hoist stuff up, you could use small flying vehicles like the drones we saw earlier to assemble a building. And this is a prototype, uh, a big demonstration done at ETH Zurich. It looks a bit like wasps building a nest. They come flying in with foam bricks and assemble them into, into the structure. 
These drones don't carry very much payload, but you can strap them together. So here are some examples of multiple drones working together to carry large structures. So you imagine a bunch of these things carrying a vent duct up to the 40th floor of a building. It would be entirely possible. Another application is what we call exoskeletons. So this is a robot that you wear. It's like an intimate dance between the wearer and the robot, and it follows you. So this is something I videoed at a robot conference in Tokyo last year. You see the, the gentleman here is being loaded up with rather a, a large number of uh, very heavy bags, and uh, he's able to carry it quite effortlessly because the weight is carried by the exoskeleton, not by his body. But it's following what he's doing. So perhaps a way of reducing workplace injuries and so on. There are a number of things that are still hard for robots, a lot of skilled stuff. I think dealing with plumbing, wiring, plastering, there'll be a decade, I think, before robots are able to do jobs like this. But perhaps there are some things that they could do, perhaps like robotic demolition is something that robots could do. And perhaps autonomous work platforms, so someone's on a work platform and then they say, work platform, yeah, go left, you know, go left the meter, and it does, it doesn't need to be driven. Okay, take home messages. The important things you need to take from this presentation. Robots move stuff from A to B. They can be an arm, it can be a thing on wheels, it can be a thing that flies. Robots can work 24 by 7. They're very, very precise. They're an important tool for improving productivity in many industries, not yet building construction. And I think that's the challenge in front of us. Robots don't look like what you think, right? They don't look like R2-D2. They look like forklift trucks. They look like crazy flying things, right? They don't look like fictional robots. They can perform many tasks, inspection, measuring, assembly, material transport. They're increasingly functional. As computers get better, as sensors get better, robots are going to get better. There's a lot of local expertise in Australia and in Brisbane, CSRO, QT, to name two. In the near future, robots will be as normal as a smartphone. That day will come. Thank you.